We have certainly vehicles that are larger. Uh, we travel more miles. And the fuel costs that are skyrocketing, equipment costs going up and insurance. And the economy of our country is continuing to grow. There's going to be more trucks going up and down the highways. Many of the county and township roads, they were built when every farmer maybe had a two axle truck and had to go to the local elevator. And now those little farms aren't there anymore and the elevators aren't there anymore. So the farms have gotten bigger, they call for bigger trucks, and they're traveling longer distances. It's projected over the next decade that there's gonna be 20 to 40% additional trucks on the road if the weight limits stay at the, at the current number. And if we don't change something, uh, we could strangle the economy because we just can't move the products that are necessary to move. We want good roads that help the economy move. There's things that definitely we all as partners in keeping our road system going, we can all be doing. We all try to achieve balance in our lives between work and play, between freedom and responsibility. It's often difficult. We need to step back and carefully weigh our options. But we know the result will be worth the time and effort. It's the same with our highways and roads and streets. They're essential parts of our lives every day. We depend on them to deliver everything we own, eat, use, grow, manufacture. But the same trucks that bring us our goods and services are also a major cause of the deterioration of our roads. So, how do we encourage commerce but still maintain our vital infrastructure? In this presentation, there will be some basic education along with the viewpoints of many stakeholders in our state's roads. You're invited to watch, listen, and then join the discussion in order to find the right balance. To understand the balance between encouraging commerce and maintaining our roads, it's important to understand the basics of pavement design and construction. Civil engineers design our roads to compensate for the two main factors that impact the life of a pavement, the strength of the soil under the pavement and the projected traffic. Engineers call the soil under the road the subgrade. The strength of that soil varies depending on whether it's clay, sand, silt, or organic material. Engineers vary the paving materials in part to compensate for soil strength. The other major factor in pavement design is traffic. Pavement is a consumable. It's consumed primarily by the vehicles that all of us drive. The more vehicles using a road, the shorter the life of the pavement. The traffic factor has two elements, the projected volume of traffic and the weights of the vehicles expected to use the road. Given the soil strength and the projected traffic, engineers design each road to perform over a finite lifespan. They determine the appropriate paving materials, the thickness of those materials, and the periodic maintenance needed to keep the pavement serviceable throughout its life. Most paved roads are composed of three layers. We just looked at the first one, the subgrade soil. Up to five feet of soil may be dug up, mixed to make it more uniform, laid down again, and compacted. Or if the subgrade found on the side is too weak, it may have to be replaced by stronger soil. Above the subgrade soil is a layer of compacted gravel called the base. Its main purpose is to provide strength to support vehicles. For some roads, the design stops there, and you have a gravel road. But for other roads, there's a third layer, the paved surface we drive on. Its purpose is to resist wear from vehicles and provide a smooth ride. It also contributes to pavement strength and keeps the other layers in place. All three layers are designed to spread out the load so pavement damage is minimized. Minnesota's road system works very much like the human circulation system. Interstates are like the main arteries in the human body. Because they receive the highest volume of traffic, engineers build them stronger with thicker driving surfaces and base layers. Obviously, that makes them very expensive. The next links in our circulation system are our state highways. Building each mile of a state highway costs a little less than half what it costs to build an interstate highway. Feeding the state highways are thousands of miles of county highways and city streets. Building each of those miles costs us about one-tenth as much as a mile of interstate highway. Finally, 
like capillaries in the circulation system, are tens of thousands of miles of township roads where all of our farm products begin their journey to market. Building a mile of gravel surface township road costs about one one hundredth as much as a mile of interstate highway. The whole system works together to handle the millions of vehicle miles we drive each year. Not all roads are designed the same or cost the same because we couldn't afford that. Instead, our local roads are designed, built, and posted for specific load limits, usually seven, nine, or 10 tons per axle. 10 ton limits would require us to build structurally heavier pavements, pavements that could sustain the weight of 10 ton loads over a long, say a 20 to 25 year life. Most counties don't have the resources to build every pavement in their county to that level. So it has to be a systematic, uniform plan to be able to connect all those roads. You just don't have enough money to build everything structurally to a 10 ton. First of all, you have to have some type of a plan of what you want the system to look like today and 25 years in the future. A plan that balances the needs of our economy with the impact of loads on our roads, which raises a good question. How do loads affect our roads? That's covered in the next section of the DVD. While intuition may tell us roads are solid and immovable, that's not really the case. Every road is impacted by each vehicle that passes over it. Here's proof. This gauge measures the amount of bending or deflection caused by the weight of a vehicle. As the truck approaches, notice that the gauge first swings to the right. That means the road surface actually moved upward a small amount in a ripple effect caused by the approaching tire. Now we'll restart the action. The gauge swings to the left as the truck moves over the pavement. That means the pavement is being deflected downward. After the truck passes, the pavement rebounds to its original position. This cross-section of a road gives us a somewhat exaggerated but still representative look at what we just saw. Notice that all of the layers of the pavement are affected by each pass of the truck. The heavier the truck, the greater the impact on the road. The result of repeated deflection is progressive deterioration of the pavement. This laboratory test shows how pavement damage progresses we're looking at a section of asphalt taken from a road and subjected to bending force from above. Again, the gauge shows movement of the asphalt as it experiences cycles of pressure and release, just as if vehicles were passing over it. After many deflections, the asphalt fatigues and a crack begins to develop at the bottom. The crack quickly grows upward, and when it reaches the surface, the asphalt fails. That's exactly what happens to our roads. So what can we do about it? Well, one idea would be to limit the weight of vehicles. But we have to recognize that restricting vehicle weight works against the goals of commerce. The more we limit truck weight, the more trips are needed to deliver the same volume of goods. So everything costs more. In the final analysis, we need to look at both shipping costs and the cost of pavement damage. It turns out that a good way to balance these concerns is to allow trucks to carry heavier loads, but to make sure that those loads are spread out more uniformly. There are several ways to accomplish this. One is to add axles to a truck. Another is to simply distribute a truck's load equally over the axles. With any of these changes, we reduce pavement fatigue so trucks carry heavier loads with minimized pavement damage. Reducing fatigue is crucial because the relationship between truck weight and pavement damage is not linear. If trucks are 20% overweight, pavement damage is doubled, and that means the life of the pavement is cut in half. By the way, you'll notice that there has been no mention of cars at all in this discussion of how loads affect roads. That's as it should be, because thousands of cars need to pass over a pavement to equal the impact of a single, fully and legally loaded 18-wheeler. In other words, when it comes to pavement construction and load limits, trucks are the major concern. That's why it's important for truck operators to observe the load limits, and that's why education and enforcement are so important. While there's no doubt that some truck operators are intentionally breaking the law and getting away with it, they're probably in the minority. Truckers want to be legal. There's too much stress and tension to be operating illegal. 
Truckers want to be informed. They want to understand the weight laws. They want to be building their trucks so they can haul the most weight possible and make the most money possible. The scenario that we have now where we have uh, a lot of voluntary compliance, I think you want to maintain that. And we also have to have an enforcement component so that haulers that are following the law, obeying the law, have a reasonable expectation that their competitors are going to be held accountable. The real importance of voluntary compliance is that we have limited resources to conduct enforcement within the borders of the state. So we have to really rely on the industry to voluntarily comply or to provide intelligence to us to help us in finding those repeat offenders. And they've been very good about that. The bulk of the industry works very hard to work within the, the weight guidelines in Minnesota. Closely related to enforcement is the issue of exemptions from the posted load limits, which have been allowed in certain situations. This has been kind of my pet peeve, is if one person is exempt, why aren't we all? Going around with different exemptions for one commodity versus another commodity, I really don't see why one person should be exempt from any rule. My three decades in law enforcement, uh, I found that when laws are consistent and fairly applied, you have more voluntary compliance. If you start granting exemptions, I believe there's a perception by certain haulers that it is no longer a fair system, that they're, they're held to a different standard than those that have the exception, and we lose a lot of that voluntary compliance, which we need. It's important to set and enforce reasonable load limits, and it's important to deal with the exemption issue. But even if road authorities did an excellent job in those areas, it wouldn't totally solve our problem because the volume of traffic is growing every day. And as you'll recall, pavement fatigue results not only from the amount of bending in a pavement, but also from the number of times the pavement bends. The more heavy vehicles that pass over a road, the shorter the road's lifespan. That means either increasing the strength of every road or being prepared to rebuild our roads more often. If we don't do one or the other, or both, we're going to have poor roads that restrict commerce, and no one wants that. I don't think there's any question that our Minnesota road system is uh, one of the economic drivers uh, and quality of life issues that we have in the state. If we could be hauling more uh, product with each trip, it would be much more economical for everybody involved. One of the challenges we have as road professionals is to try to marry our needs and our abilities with the needs of the industry that's out there. We have to find a balance of bringing those heavier loads into the state, keeping our producers very viable and profitable to keep our state economy going. But then again, we can't bankrupt the road account in trying to keep roads fixed and repaired. And it's just a matter of finding a balance. You can't just increase your weight limits and think the road is going to be OK. The road's built to a certain standard, and it can't handle more weights or else it'll fall apart. People in our communities know the need for a good infrastructure. They know how important transportation is to their daily lives. And so we have to ensure that our infrastructure is what it needs to be. The strength of our roads is not the same all year long. It varies with the seasons. Roads have their greatest strength in the winter. The water trapped in the base and subgrade is frozen solid, adding to the strength of the pavement. Then, in the spring, the base and subgrade begin to thaw out, and our pavements become much more vulnerable. When the air temperature reaches about 35 to 40 degrees for several days in a row, we have a layer of soggy, waterlogged base material under the paved surface. When a loaded truck comes along, it's easy to see what's going to happen. With reduced support from the underlying materials, the surface layer deflects more and wears out faster. We're all familiar with the result pothole season. Because of this, reduced spring load limits are set and posted on our roads. There's billions and billions of dollars been invested in the county highways and the state highways in the state of Minnesota and it's really important to protect that investment that we have all already made and that's what spring load restrictions do. When the weather starts warming up, which we all appreciate in the spring of the year, we have a uh, issue where the roadbed starts to thaw out and is not able to carry the loads that we have on our county road or our transportation system today. They're very necessary, yeah. Mother Nature again. The freezing and thawing, and when those roads thaw out, they're, they're, they're soft. And, and you, you can't haul on them when they're that way. Spring road restrictions, when we hauled livestock, was one thing we had to contend with. 
daily. It's on for two months and you learn to adjust. Since repairing our roads is so expensive, it's essential that everyone obey the spring load limits. So once again, enforcement becomes part of the issue. I've been asked as a county commissioner, why don't we have more enforcement? We don't have the amount of investment that we can afford to have deputies, police officers at every intersection or every major road doing the enforcement. As with every other aspect of this complex issue, the solution is to find a balance. The need is to compare the good we all receive from commerce with the cost incurred if fair spring load limits aren't set and enforced. Undoubtedly, managing our highway system for the common good of all will require a lot of give and take by all stakeholders. Finding that balance where we can give everybody an even playing field and maintain a set of limitations that give us that longest life out of our roads and as well as benefiting all users of the road system. This is a, a community problem, it's a state problem, it's not an industry versus local government problem. Everybody benefits from a good quality road in terms of the transportation, the safety, the moving of the products, economic development. If we're going to get serious about infrastructure funding, it needs to be a, a pretty comprehensive package. There's going to need to be tax dollars involved, there will be bonding dollars, and then there needs to be user fees in the terms of permits, uh, probably a gas tax increase. Uh, that all drivers, all users of the road would be contributing through the gas tax. It's really important that we invest in our infrastructure so that we don't end up um, not having the capacity to take care of the people who use our roads and our economy. It trickles down right down to the end consumer, so right from the manufacturer through the transportation industry down to the end consumer. We're all paying for it. In a balanced solution, funds must be set aside for building and maintaining roads posting and enforcing load limits, and keeping the public informed of the law. State, county, township, and city officials, law enforcement officers, judges, the trucking industry, and every other citizen will need to work together as a team to protect the investment in our road systems. The best news is that if everyone can work together to find that balanced solution, it will cost less than repairing and reconstructing our roads after the pavement is damaged. That's such a good deal, nobody can afford to pass it up. I'm Don Shelby. Thanks for giving this issue your most careful consideration. Our economy depends on it.